Good to have you with us in church. Thank you, praise team. You guys are the best. And we're talking about identity in action. How you identify becomes the action of your life. You do what you do or you don't do what you don't do because of how you see you. So there may be opportunities that have come your way, but you say, you know, I don't know if that's really for me. I tried that before and it didn't work. My mama always told me I wasn't very good at that. I don't think that, you know, I I, got to be careful. You know, you got to watch out. And so you, you hold back from some things because of how you see you. And then there are other things that you go for it because of how you see you. Think of it like this. How you see you is the most powerful force in your life. It's even more powerful than how God sees you. Think about that. Do you you believe it? (laughs) Can you get your mind around it? Because God could say, you can do all things. But you say, "I I don't have time. I can't do that. I'm not very, I've never been very good at that. My, my husband would never let me. My wife won't let me. Uh, who, do you think, who do you think I am? I mean, I can't. So God could say, you are able. But if you say, I'm not able, you become more powerful in your life than even the words of God. So your identity is a uh, big part, a huge part of your life. And I think it's why in our world today, in our culture today, the spirit of the world, which is a spirit of antichrist, is trying to get people to be confused about their identity, to, to identify with things that do not define us. You, you are more than what the world is calling gender identity, sexual identity, uh, identity politics. These are things that the spirit of this world has generated to confuse and to hurt people. Because when you know your father, you know that he created you and you are who he says you are. You can do what he says you can do. And so that godly identity, that identity in Christ, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And when you get that, when you start living that, limits come off your life. You stop believing you're a victim. You you stop believing you're limited. You, You stop thinking, I can't. It'll never work. And, and a whole new way of life, a whole new realm of life opens up to you. And that's what we're praying for you. Uh, Caleb said last week, God designed you and didn't ask you what you think about it. Right? And we've all had those moments where we wish we were like somebody else. Right? Maybe somebody's singing and you're like, man, I wish I could sing like them. Yeah, well, God had a plan for you and he created you because that's how you can live your best life. So your goal is not to be like somebody else. Stop following social media and trying to get somebody else's nose. Right, stop following the, the quote influencer or the star and trying to be like them. For you to live your highest and best life, find what God says about you in general and specifically and be that. Be that person God created you to be. I met the author of my story. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. Who's the author of your story? Well, my mama always said, okay, yeah, well, you are not the water boy, so stop talking about your mama. (laughs) You know that movie, Russell? That's crazy. That's old school right there. You got to be old to know that movie. My mama, 
My mama always said, but many of us are following things that maybe parents, maybe public school, maybe governments, or social groups, social uh, 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 messaging, and we start building our identity based on what other people have said. Maybe sometimes good, a lot of times not so good. And so we have to consciously say, wait, I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. My best life, my highest life will be when I'm living the life that he has planned for me. His plan is better than anybody else's. Amen. Now, last, uh, last time I, I spoke, I talked to you about the story where Moses is uh, talked to by God in the burning bush, right? So Moses is 80 years old, and the Lord comes to him, and the Lord says, Moses, we, we got to go into Egypt, and we got to get Israel free. We got to get them out because they've been slaves for over 400 years and no more. I'm going to set my people free, and I'm going to take them to the promised land, the land that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so God gave Israel that land where they are now. God gave it to them back when it was just Abraham and then his son Isaac and then Jacob. So when people ask me about Israel and issues over there right now, look, when God put them there, God put them there. And he didn't ask us what we think. Now, Israel has messed up so many times. They keep going away from God. Every time they go away from God, they get in trouble. It's tragic. It's sad. But God still put them there. And God said in the last days, there will be a return to the Lord. There's going to be a revival amongst the Jewish people. So he'll work it out in the end, but we're just going to agree with God. I would advise you, anything God does, just agree with it because you're not going to change his mind. And if you get on the wrong side fighting against something God does, you will always lose. I mean, this Palestinian thing, it's obvious. It's not going to work out well. So we're going to just stay faithful to what God does. That doesn't mean everything, all the Israelites are good or right or whatever. It just means that's what God does. So God says to Moses, you are going to lead my people to freedom to the promised land. And Moses said, who am I? So here's the question. Who am I? It's always the identity question. Who am I? Moses didn't say, you can't do it. Moses said, I can't do it. So many times we get stuck in our own limited identity. I can't do it. I've never done it before. I didn't go to school. My family has never done it. No one in my tribe has ever done it. Right? We get stuck in an identity that limits our vision, what we can see for our life, for our future. And so that's what holds us back. So Moses then says to God, well, even if I did go to the elders of Israel and I say, the Lord wants to set you free from slavery and take you back to your promised land. And, and what if they say to me, what's his name? which is really kind of silly to me. I mean, that, that doesn't sound like an insurmountable problem. What's his name? What's the Lord's name? And that's where in the Bible, the Lord said, say my name, say my name. Right? Was it in the Bible? Or was that Beyonce? It was Beyonce or Michael or somebody. Say my name. So God says to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, he established a name that's unlimited. I am. I am what you need. I'm more than you need. I'm more than you can comprehend. I am. I exist beyond time. I exist beyond space. I am. And I always am. The same yesterday, today, 
and forever. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees one day, I am, and kind of freaked them out. That name carries some level of spiritual reality. And God said to Moses, you go in there and you tell the elders of Israel, I am sent me. Well, you know how the story goes. Moses led them out and they took over the promised land. And I mean, there was a lot of steps in between, but it did come to pass. So knowing the great I am, knowing that he's your father, he's your creator, and he defines you. Now, Moses did not start on his journey to destiny until he was 80 years old, which means there's hope for some of you. <laughs> Regularly, I have people come to me, Pastor, I'm 32, my, my best days are over. I'm like, what? I'm 32, the, the opportunity passed me by. It's too late for me. I'm 34, and I don't have a wife. What am I going to do? Uh, find one? <laughs> Stop thinking it's too late, right? Moses was 80 when he got started. So I don't know. Is there anybody in the room over 80? Maybe a couple, but it's not too late, no matter who you are. So Moses begins to believe God has a plan for my life, and that's who I am. The I am tells me who I am, and that changed everything. Everything in Moses' world began when he believed, I am who God says I am. And that's what I want for you. That's what we're praying for you that you are not identified by a nation, a nationality, or by a color, a race, or by a gender, or by an age, that you believe, I am who God says I am. And then you get into his word, you find out what he says about you in the Bible, and you, you're getting into your prayer life, so you're finding out what God puts in your spirit. Maybe you've been doing what somebody told you you should do, what some SAT score or some uh, 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 you know, vocational test told you, but, but God has something so far beyond that, and you never even thought about it because your identity has been set by a small world with small thinking and not godly thinking. Right? Even our mom and dad, they love us, but if they didn't know God or they were struggling with their own issues, they pass those issues on to us. And we get limited by their limitations. Like my parents would always say, we're not like rich people. Which, number one, that means we're not rich. Uh, number two, we're poor. So that identity is how I grew up. A mantra in our house is we can't afford that. We can't afford that. Well, why not? Why can't we? Why don't we do something so that we can afford it? Well, that takes a new way of thinking, a new identity. I need to believe what God says about me. I remember when I went to the, the rehab center and then started Bible school, and then Wendy and I are in Bible school, and about our third year of Bible school, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna start a church. And I started telling people, we're going to start a church. We're going to have a great church in South King County. We're going to touch thousands of lives. We're going to influence our state for Jesus. And my parents found out, and other people from Spanaway, where I grew up, found out. And people would say things like, who do you think you are? And I will say, first, I got out of Spanaway. In other words, I got out of the small mentality. I got out of the, we're just here to survive. We're just poor folks hanging on. I got out of that negative world. And when you bust out of whatever world you've been in, somebody not going to like it. Somebody is not going to like it. Your mama going to say, who do you think you are? That is not how I raised you. And you're going to say, amen to that. <laughs> in other words, it's like the crab in the bucket. One crab will reach up to the top of the bucket, pull himself up, and fall out. But two crabs 
One will always pull the other back down, and they will both die in the bucket. So when your friend is offended because you go into a better place, you rising up in your career, you're increasing your finances, you're experiencing a new level of blessing and opportunity. And your friend said, oh, you don't have time for me anymore. You too cool for school. You used to be friend. Now you too good for me. Just say, you know, I met a guy who's like you, a crab in a bucket. <laughs> you can follow me and get out, or you can keep on whining about where you're at. And that's the process of life. You have to be willing to get out of your bucket. And somebody's not going to like it, but it's good. It's worth it. And it works. It can happen for all of us. Now, I've given you several things, and Caleb's given you several things that God said about you. Like Matthew 5 and verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. You bring the flavor. Stop saying, I'm not good in groups. I get nervous and small. I don't know how to talk to You're the salt of the earth. When you show up, the flavor comes out. In your mind, this group has been very bland. But it's okay, because I'm here now. I can't tell you how many people we invite to life groups. We invite to dream team and get involved in various aspects of ministry. And, it, oh, you know, I get nervous. For, I don't want to have to talk to people. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Stop. Get that new identity. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. That might have been a school teacher or a family member or an ex Ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, ex-wife, ex-girlfriend, all the exes that came from Texas <laughs> may have told you you're not good at that. But you, God said, are the salt. You bring the flavor. You add the spice. You are great. You are the light of the world. When you come in, the room gets brighter. Stop feeling like they won't miss me. They don't care if I'm there or not. I can go to church, not go. I go to church once every three or four months. They don't even know. That's because of your identity, how you see you. But God says you are salt and you are light. You bring the illumination. You bring the bright. When you show up, the room is brighter. So you begin to believe that. You, you will say, Pastor, that sounds kind of kind of egotistical, no brag, just fact. It's not because I'm cool. It's because God told me. God created me. I'm just being what God created. Really, you and I cannot brag about anything that we just received, right? You received your height. You didn't do anything to get tall or get sharp. You are what you are. You received that. You received your hair. Not everybody can have lovely red hair like mine. <laughs> but I didn't do anything to get that. I just received it, yeah. right? So, so there's no ego in it. I, God did it. I didn't do it, right? So everything that God says about you doesn't puff you up. It doesn't make you feel like I'm better than somebody. No, I just am what God says I am. I didn't decide. I didn't even choose this. I'm just believing what the Bible says and what the Lord did. So that's got to be our attitude towards life. This, this false humility, this I'm so stupid, I'm so no good, I could never get, I could never live debt free, I could never be, and that's all the lies that this dark world has put into our mind. We're going to start believing I am the salt. I bring flavor. Everywhere I go, it tastes better just because I was there. I am the light. I illuminate the room. Everywhere I go, things look better. The lighting gets better because I'm here. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying what my father said. All right, look in 2 Corinthians. 
2 Corinthians 5. Verse 16 said, we don't identify according to the flesh, right? This is not about your natural, physical appearance or your nationality or your country or your tribe. Those are all fleshly things. And we are one new nation, one new people, one new race in Christ Jesus. No longer Jew or Gentile, black or white, bond or free, but all is new in Christ. So we don't identify according to the flesh. And if we are in Christ, we are new creations. Now this means no matter what has happened in your past, it does not define your future. Well, my parents all, you know, everybody in my family's been poor. Everybody's had heart problems and everybody's been divorced. Yeah, but you're a new creation. Yeah, but all my family have this. Yeah, but you're a new creation with a new father and there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Yes, it's my. Stop talking about your past and start talking about the new, the future, the opportunities. Well, Pastor, I'm 43 years old now. I mean, I'm getting tired. That's because you live in your past. You're constantly looking back. That'll wear you out. If you're looking forward, you're excited. You got energy. You got vision. Vision brings energy and motivation. So, if you keep looking in your rear view mirror, you're going to crash. But if you start looking out your windshield, you're going to see some great opportunities ahead. So I am a new creation. The past failures, they don't define me. Yeah, well, I've been divorced and I had an abortion and, and I was abused and I've been poor and I was this and I was that. Yeah, I get it. We all been there. Let's all brag about how bad our past was. Or let's talk about being new creation, being new in Christ. I am a new creation, and the scripture said, old things have passed away, and all things have become new. I like new things. I want new things. Everything I do, I want it to be new. I want it to be fresh. I want to have new visions and new faith and new hope and new excitement and and new opportunities. I'm going to sing a new song to the Lord. You know, we always get people who come up to us and say, how come we don't sing more of those old songs? Because nowhere in the Bible did it say, sing an old song for the Lord. What does your Bible say? Sing a new song. Now, old songs are great, and I like nostalgia and and old songs and stuff like that, but it's more important to stay fresh, to stay creative, to bring the new in every aspect of life. So if you keep looking back, you're going to crash. You start looking forward, you're going to find new things that God has planned for you. Now, let's keep going in 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Let's, let's walk like ambassadors. I'm an official, I'm an official person. I, I'm an important person. I'm an ambassador. I represent. You know, we love to represent in our world today. We, we represent our favorite beer on our T-shirt. We represent our team on our jacket. I put on my Harley coat. I represent Harley and Davidson. (laughs) Love to represent. Well, what about representing your father? Representing your, your Lord? I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm here to represent. And and I can tell you, he he loves you. He he spoke to me today about this. I, I can talk to you personally as a representative. He loves you. He he will heal you. He will bless you. He will lift you out of that abuse. He he, he will bring you to a new place in life. He personally has let me know, and I'm here to represent, right? Start carrying yourself like a Christian, (laughs) representing Jesus. Yeah, you're an ambassador. And then the next verse 
He took your sin and gave you his righteousness. He was made to be sin so that you could be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So I am salt. I am light. I am a new creation. I am an ambassador. I am righteous. Okay, I'm just trying to help you build a vision, build the words for this new identity. Nowhere did it say you're poor, you're sickly, you're weak, you're too old, you're, you're, you're not smart enough. No, that's not in there. Everything God says about you is good. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. He's going to give us three more words to identify with. Three more words. He says, first of all, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as a good soldier, you endure hardships. It's going to be some hard days. It's going to be some challenging times. Kids are going to you know, put you through some changes. Economics can go up and down. And life throws a curveball. So you are a good soldier. The first thing soldiers do is don't die. Okay, my son's been in the Army for 10 years. Basic training, all of his training, they remind him, soldiers, don't die. We need you to live. That's job one. Number two, help us win this battle. Help us overcome whatever it is we're facing. So you and I, we're good soldiers. I'm not just hanging on. Number one, I'm going to live. Number two, I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to kick some butt today. When I woke up, the devil said, oh, no. I'm going to get my butt kicked again. Yeah, when I wake up, the devil runs because I kick him all over town. I'm a soldier. I fight. And Pastor, what if we don't feel like fighting? Come down here so I can slap you. <laughs> Come on, man. Stop talking like a loser and, and, and a crybaby. And, and I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to say you got to fight for the right to partake. Was that in the Bible, Russ? Fight for the right to parties. It's in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> who said that? Rage against the machine. I don't know who said that. <laughs> you got to fight if you want to live. Because if you punk out, you're going to die. Sickness going to kill you. Accident going to kill you. Pandemic going to kill you. Government going to kill you. Something going to kill you. Or... You can, the Bible said, choose life. And that's what the soldier does. The soldier says, I'm going to live and I'm going to win this war. I'm going to win this battle. The second thing in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is God said, the athlete competes for a prize. He competes to win. So now you guys following football, we got the championship games today. You know, is it Herm Edwards or Tony Dungy? You play to win the game. We get up every day to win our game. I'm going to win today. I'm going to win the game, and I'm going to get better commissions. I'm going to do more business. I'm going to be more of a blessing to my family. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to win my game. I didn't give up to just hang on get through another day, and then get home and tell the kids I'm tired. Daddy needs some me time. See, this is the identity that drains the life out of us. You got to think, I'm an athlete. Athletes get up and train. What's the athlete say? No days off. If you want to be great, if you want to be a champion, you want to be a winner, no days off. What else do you hear from the athletes? Do your job. If you're a lineman, if you're a tight end, if you're a linebacker, if you're a safety, do your job. Well, coach, uh, 
you know, I didn't really feel, I didn't feel like doing it because I, I was thinking I, I should have a coffee break. What does the coach say? You out. Get me somebody that will do their job. Okay, so this is how God identifies you and I. The soldier, the athlete. Number three, the farmer. The farmer must first be partaker of the crops. In other words, you can't feed anybody else if you can't feed yourself. You gotta produce. What do farmers do? They show up every day. Farmers show up every day. When I was a kid, my grandparents were farmers in Yakima, and, and, and we would go over for the summer, just spend a few days with them. Man, I did not want to be a farmer. Every day, like they, Saturday, you got to show up. Sunday, yep, you show up. You got to get up every morning, like 5 a.m., milking the cows, and then gassing up the tractors and hooking up. Some days we're plowing, some days we're irrigating, some days we're planting. You got to show up every day. And I would say to Grandpa, Grandpa, can we play today? Yeah, we'll play like 6 p.m., 13-hour day. Farmer, that's the mentality, right? That's, that's how we identify. I am salt. I am light. I am a new creation. I am an ambassador, the righteousness of God. I am a soldier in the army. Soldier in the army. I was, I was 19 years old preaching at a church downtown Seattle, and we were trying to sing these cute little, okay, don't get mad at me, but they were cute little white people songs. And one sister, <laughs> one sister jumped up in the middle of church, and she said, I'm a soldier. And I said, Lord, what happened? And she just busted out singing, in the army. And I was on the drums playing with our little white people band. And I just said, okay, let's go. We, I don't know how long we went off. Soldier in the army. Okay, so that's what God said about you. I didn't say that. God said that. And God said, you're an athlete. You're an athlete. No days off. We play to win the game. And number three, God said, you're a farmer. Let's grow it. Let's produce it. Let's make it happen. Let's show up every day. Okay, so this is how we identify. This is who we are. This is what God says about us. Let me give you a list, just help you break it down a little bit. Remember, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. But pastor... You don't know how I feel. Trying to get you to change your feelings. Trying to get you to follow something else. Let's follow the Bible. All right, number one, I am born of God. Here's our list. I am born of God. 1 John 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Number two, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Number three, I'm a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Uh, number four, I am righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him to be sin so I could be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Number five, is it five? I am an ambassador. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Number six, I am an overcomer. First John chapter five, verse four, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. If you identify as an overcomer, you just get up every day and overcome. Right. Right. Oh, but pastor, I I'm a victim. Uh, I've been abused, and I didn't go to school, and, and I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. Okay, you can identify with that, or you can identify with the Lord and start overcoming. Think of all the people here in our church today who were born in another nation, came to America, didn't know the language, and had very little money, few dollars, and they're just 
believing to overcome. And they get a little job and they start saving and they get a car and they start saving and then they get a better job and, and then they start their own business. And, and, and pretty soon that business is prospering and they're buying their own home and now they're living in nice homes and they got money in the bank and they speak multiple languages and their children are growing up blessed and their grandchildren are growing up blessed and, and right next door, there's a family and the, and the kids are saying, we can't afford it, and we don't feel like going to school, and, and, and we can't ever catch a break. When's the government going to send me some money? You see what I'm saying? You can be born on the wrong side, whatever side that is, and still win. Or you can be born on the right side and still lose. It's your identity. It's your identity. You can be poor, but you identify as prosperous. You can be starting with nothing, but you identify as successful. That's the overcomer. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible. You should read it. Is that in the Bible? Who said that? Nellie? Huh? Huh? Who said that? Probably some rapper. Okay, where am I? Overcomer. Uh, uh, number six, number seven. I'm more than a conqueror. Romans 8, verse 37. All, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. I'm not more than a conqueror because I'm cool. I'm more than a conqueror because of him who loves me. Then, I am blessed to be a blessing. I identify as blessed. A lot of people stop me in different places, and they say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Sure, be happy to pray. What are we praying for? Well, I just need a blessing. Why do you identify as not being blessed? You're always looking, waiting, hoping, wanting a blessing. Let's identify as blessed. I am blessed. Hey, pastor, I just want to pray for you. I want to speak a blessing over you. Okay, bring it. Right? It's just an identity shift. I am blessed. Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit has filled my life. The Word of God said, I'm blessed coming in, blessed going out. I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field. God has blessed my storehouses. He's blessed my children. I am blessed. Genesis 12 and verse 2, I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. All right, there's the next one. I am healed. I'm not sick trying to get healed. I am healed. Now, some days I have pains, I have challenges, but I identify as healed. Why? Because Jesus bore my sickness, carried my disease, and with his stripes, I was healed. Right? 1 Peter 2, 24. He bore my sin that I might be righteous. By his stripes, I was healed. Fred Price, our pastor, has passed away, but in the early days, he would say, you were healed, you is healed, you are healed. You is not sick. But that's an identity choice, isn't it? Because what do many of us say? My headaches, my back problem, my bad hip, my diabetes. Really? It's yours? Oh, yeah, I own that sucker. <laughs> now, you think that it's no big deal to own sickness and disease, but it could be, it probably is the very thing that stops you from getting rid of it. You can be sick, but don't identify with it. I've had, I've had the hepatitis. I've had all the illnesses, all the pains, all the stuff. Wendy and I have had that. But we never identify as sick people. We identify as healed in the name of Jesus. I identify with healing and wholeness. And you know, it's amazing I just keep going through stuff. 
you get the pain, you get the problem, and then you turn around one day and you say, where did where'd that thing go? You just, you just overcome. You just get healed. It's amazing. I had a guy the other day who was complaining about his knees, and he was talking about the pain in his knees, and Wendy and I have had some pains like that, and he's like, my pains, and he goes, well, I'm 57. I guess I should expect it. He goes, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 68. He goes, what the hell am I talking to you for? He thought his age identified him as sick, as with pain. So he had, he'd accepted it because of his age. And I said, nah, I ain't going to accept that. I refuse. I'm getting in my ice plunge. I'm going to shake it off. It's also in the Bible. Shake it off. Shake it off. Okay, where, where am I? Somebody help me. I am healed. Okay, here's the next one. I, where's our list? I am prosperous. I'm not poor. I will afford it. Maybe, maybe not today, but I can afford it. I will afford it. I am prosperous. I'm going to have everything I ever wanted. Some things I don't want. One time... Not long ago, a, a friend said to me, Pastor, we bought you a Rolls Royce. And I said, that's, that's really nice. I appreciate that. But if I was driving a Rolls Royce in the great Northwest, I would be one of about three. And the church folks would, would be mad at me. The neighbors would be mad at me. There'd be five people who loved it. It's a way to go, Pastor. And there'd be 5,000 people who said, that preacher, he's took all the money. So I said, bro, let's take the money from the Rolls Royce and let's just put it into some kind of ministry. So in heaven, I've got a Rolls Royce waiting for me. Some people still haven't forgiven me. Remember, we used to rent a helicopter to fly up to Mill Creek. And some people think that I owned a helicopter and I just fly around in my helicopter. I should. I'd just be flying it down to the South Center Mall. be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So pe people, you can do a lot of things, but you start prospering. Mama going to be mad. Daddy going to be mad. The neighbor's going to be mad. Everybody going to be mad when you prosper. But God wants you to prosper so you can help somebody so you can build, so you can be a blessing, so you can make a difference in this world. Hey, we're going to build, we're going to build three new campuses in the next couple of years. Why don't you build one of them? We, we only need five or 10 million. You got that. You got that. Come on. Let's go. Okay, 3 John, verse 2. You prosper in all things, even as your soul prospers. You don't prosper when mom and daddy prosper. You don't prosper when the government prospers. You prosper when your soul prospers. Okay, here's another one. I am peaceful. The peace of God that passes understanding guards my heart and my mind. But pastor, I have anxiety. Yeah, we'll get peaceful. <laughs> Identify with peace. Embrace the peace of God. Believe the peace of God is part of your life. Identify as a peaceful person. I'm salt. I am light. I could go on and on. I want to give you one last story. Genesis, uh, Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. This is a story about Gideon. Now, you know Gideon. You've heard of Gideon. He, he's a little guy. He, he just went about putting Bibles in hotels. <laughs> I'm beginning to realize that a lot of people don't know what that is. Yeah, right, right. Have you not seen the Gideon Bible in the hotel? Or no matter what I say in church, you're not going to respond to it. That, that's the deal? Okay, I get it. But Gideon was, was just a, kind of a survivor, just trying to get by. He, he, he was not a... Not a leader, not a warrior, not a prosperous guy. He was just trying to survive. And the Midianites had taken over Israel. They had, 
Because Israel always rejects God, enemies come in, take over, right? Rebel against God, enemy takes over. Happened many times with Israel. So the Midianites are taxing them, controlling them, taking all their crops, taking all their stuff, and they're, they're controlling Israel. So the angel of the Lord in Judges chapter 6 and verse 11 goes to Gideon while he's hiding in a wine press, right, like a little tub, and he's trying to thresh enough wheat to make some bread. So he's not thinking overcome, more than a conqueror, soldier. No, he's thinking hide and survive. Okay, this is where many people are. Hide and survive. Keep your head down. Don't get involved. Just try to survive. So the angel of the Lord says, Yo, Gideon, the Lord's with you, you mighty man of valor. It's literally what the Lord says, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, what? Who are you talking to? I'm poor. I'm weak. The Lord left us. The Lord has abandoned us. So now here, think about this. The Lord is right there talking to him, and he is saying, the Lord abandoned us. And the Lord's like, bro. (laughs) Now, you've said maybe at one point in your life, if I could just see an angel, if God would do a miracle, if God would talk to me, I would believe. Not, it's not true. If you can't believe what the Bible said, if God showed up in your bathroom while you were drying off, <laughs> and the Lord said, yo, you mighty man of valor, you'd be like, Lord, come on. You left us. We're nobodies. We got nothing. Gideon is arguing with God. And then the Lord says, go in this might, for I will be with you. And Gideon continued to argue. I'm poor, I'm weak, and my whole family is weak. So he not only jumped under the bus, he threw his whole family under the bus. Everybody in my family is a bunch of losers. Ain't nobody done nothing in my house. I don't know who, why you're talking to me, Lord. You should have picked somebody else. But God kept talking to him. And then a miracle happened. A sacrifice was burned. And then he heard the enemy speaking about this new guy named Gideon. And Gideon began to believe. God said, now I need you to get the army of Israel together, and we're going to go fight. We're going to fight for the right. To party! (laughs) Gideon said, all right. 10,000 guys showed up to fight. 10,000, let's go. Gideon said, how many of you trust God? How many of you have faith? How many of you are tithers? 9,700 guys went home. He was left with 300. Remember, I started our legacy team. We, We were looking for 300, Gideon's army. 300 guys, they said, all right, we're with you. Let's go. And they made a plan. They got these lamps and these torches, and they got bugles, trumpets, and they set up around the encamp of the enemy, and they broke the light and the flash all around them, and the bugles, the trumpets were blaring, and Gideon's army started running down the hill at the Midianites, who far outnumbered them. But the enemy got scared and started killing each other. And 300 men, led by one poor, weak man who got a new identity, defeated the enemy. You can lead your family and grow that company and start that business and prosper in this time and rise above the limitations and overcome the sickness. Beat that cancer. Beat that diabetes. Beat that hepatitis C. Overcome and be more than a conqueror. 
and you can get out of debt and live debt free and be all that God says you are. Because I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Come on, church. Let's believe it. Let's embrace it. Let's say it to ourselves. No days off. We play to win. We're soldiers. Soldiers in the army, in the army of the Lord. Man, I wish I could sing. All right, close your eyes. We're going to pray.